Well, about in June, the last time I had the privilege of bringing God's Word, we talked about identity focus. I don't know if you were all here, but um, tonight we're going to hook on to that. I'm not going to review. We're going to hook on to this. Tonight we're going to learn how to walk in him. And that might sound, oh, sure, yeah, yeah, I do that, or yeah, I can do that. But it's so amazing to me how much more we need to understand these things. So tonight, for the sound booth, this is, you don't have to put part two, but it is called Walk in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We humble ourselves before you. We understand that we desperately need you and we entirely depend on, on you. <clears throat> Excuse me, on you. Father, we ask that you would open our understanding and flood it with your light tonight so that we can do what you've asked us to do. Because apart from you, we cannot. And we thank you for it ahead of time. We expect you to flood our understanding with light tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I can already tell I better open this guy. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> okay. We're going to turn to our foundation scripture. Let's start in Colossians chapter 2. And verse 6. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. It's going to be our foundation scripture. Like the foundation of a well-built house. Amen? The word of the Lord says, As you therefore have received him, now walk in him. How many have received the Lord Jesus Christ? Everybody in the room? Praise God. So the first thing we need to do is receive him. Amen? But then he gives us a command. And he says, now walk in him. Now, I want you to hang on to that. I, want, I do not want you to lose sight of those words. Now walk in him. This is the dividing line or the separating factor, if you will, between the person who is going to heaven and the person who is actually experiencing and manifesting heaven on the earth. It's the dividing line. So, how do I walk in him? When I read that scripture, you'd, I don't want you to raise your hand, but did you immediately have how to walk in him show up? Or perhaps just some showed up, or what our idea of what we think walking in him is showed up or maybe you don't yet know at all how to walk in him and all of that is okay 
it's okay to locate. So the first thing we must do is identify with him. And we talked about focus identity last two months ago, I guess it's been. We must focus and we must first identify with him. How can I walk in him if I don't identify with him? So again, this is that separating factor where many people have received Jesus, yet there are still many that are susceptible to sin, perhaps a slave to sin, or sickness, not truly seeing themselves free because they don't yet identify with Jesus. In Galatians 2, remember Apostle Paul? He said, it's no longer I who live. That is a profound statement, but it is the truth. Well, if Paul can say that, and it's real to him, then we can say that. And it can be. So some things that Jesus has said to us in the word are almost like, do I dare believe that? Well, we don't say it, but it's, we almost like, gosh, really? Really, I can walk like that? <clears throat> it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I live now in this flesh, not when I get home to heaven, right here in the flesh, that should bring you hope. And now I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You see, Paul identified with his Lord's death. That's how he got there. And that's where we're going tonight. He had to identify with the Lord's death in order to reach it's no longer I who live. How could you say it any other way? So, <clears throat> you and I must identify with his death. There's much talked about when it comes to our victory in Christ and conquering and winning in Christ and, and, and I'm not saying, and his resurrection and identifying with all of that and that is a tremendous reality and something that we should grab hold of. But we also must understand that before you can identify with his resurrection, you must first identify with his death. Because that's what he did first. Have you ever thought of it? When you build a house, you must first build a solid foundation. Well, in discipling a young baby Christian, we must first help them identify with his death. I've been crucified with Christ. We need to see the fact that when Christ died, when he took on sin and sickness, not only did he die for me, not only did he die as me, but this is also the day I died. And I need to see that day Jesus died on the cross. That was the day I died. When Jesus was buried in that tomb, that was the day I was buried. I need to see my grave clothes sitting right next to his grave clothes. If that's too much for you, just chew on it. I need to identify with his death. These are the purposes of water baptism. With water baptism, 
water baptism doesn't get you saved, but it is an outward symbol of truly what happened to your Lord. When I died, I go under the water, and when I come up out of the water, that's the day Deborah came alive unto God. This is identifying with his death, baptism, water baptism. A powerful chapter in regards to these truths. We're going to go to where I lived for, I'll bet, three years, literally lived in Romans 6, 7, and 8. But we're going to go to Romans 6, chapter 1. I mean, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. We're going to go there. In regards to these truths, it's, it says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. How shall we, you need to underline this in your Bible, how shall we who died to sin still live in it. What did Paul say? We died to sin. Underline that. Verse 3, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, here we go again, have been baptized into his death? We must identify with his death first. And I, I think it's been a bit skipped. When we disciple, if you're discipling someone now, this is very important. You can't jump into the resurrection. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. And if we don't know this, and you'll see that as we go along, it causes a lot of stumbling. How do you know what you've been made alive unto? I'm going to say that again. How do you know what you've been made alive unto if, if you don't understand what you've died to? How can you identify with his resurrection if you don't first identify with his death? We were baptized into his death. It wasn't just Jesus who died. You died too. We must see that. And in one sense, it's a co-crucifixion. As much as it was a co-resurrection. He was your substitute. He was your substitute. Verse 4, Romans 6 and verse 4. Therefore, here we go again, we have been buried with him. See, I wasn't crazy. It's right there in the Word. We've been buried with him through baptism, with him through death. Notice the identification and union here. You see, this is the way God sees it. When Jesus died, we died. When Jesus was buried, we were buried with him. Now pay attention to the truth and reality here. The rest of verse 4. Just as... Those are not small words. Just as Christ, just as Christ was raised from the dead 
through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Wow. This is not when you get home to heaven. This is here and now. Because of our union with Christ, which we talked a lot about in the last time, we died because of our union with Christ. We died to sin and we are alive unto God. Is that real to you? Well, perhaps, but it can become more real. And it will change you big time. Death to sin, listen carefully, death to sin is the separation from the ruling power of sin in one's own life. You've died to sin. You're dead to sin. Death to sin is the separation. Death is always separation. Death to sin Oh, I can't say it enough because I hear it more and more and more. Death to sin is the separation from that ruling power of sin in one's own life. Now jump down to verse 14 for just a moment. For sin shall not be master or have dominion over you, for you are not under the law. You are under grace. Sin shall not be your master anymore. Because you died to it. When he died, you died. I'm telling you, if you'll mutter this with the five stomachs of a cow, and I am not joking, if you will mutter this and mutter this and mutter this for as long as you'd like, you will not even recognize yourself as things start falling off of you that you didn't know were still clinging to you. Meditating on the death of your Lord. Go back to verse 5. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So he doesn't leave it out. He just gave you the whole circle there in a sentence. Verse 6. Knowing this, always underline that. The word now, <laughs> knowing this, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. She be dead. Removed. In order that our body of sin might be done away with or rendered inoperative. Sin has been rendered inoperative. It's like taking the keys. Now the car doesn't run. Inoperative. So that we would be no longer slaves to sin. Verse 7. For he who has died is what? Freed from sin. We've already established that you've died. When he died... You died. So for, verse 7, for he who has died is freed from sin. When Jesus died, you died. And on that day, you went from being a slave to sin and the curse to its master. Not only are you free from sin, but you're free from sickness and disease. Now, back in the day, Miss Marine taught in healing school on what I'm about to bring you in a small package. 
but it must be a complete part of what you just heard. This isn't separate. This is all truth. So not only are you free today, right here, right now, from sin, but you are free from sickness and disease and pain, and I could stand here all night with the list. Anything under the curse. You have to understand that sin was the root of all the curse. When Adam sinned, that's when the curse was let loose. That curse was the root, and from it flowed the curse of sickness, disease, lack, poverty, addiction, on and on. Mental illness, anxiety, depression. You could say it like this, he who has died is free from sickness, disease, lack, poverty, addiction, mental illness, anxiety, and on and on. We've been translated and put into God's system, and that makes you immune to the curse and the fruits of it. I'm not telling you that you won't have tests and trials, but, but you don't have to suffer to something you've died to. You're dead to sin. You're dead to sickness. You're dead to disease. You're dead to pain. But until you get that from here to here, you won't experience it. It's still true. It's still so. That's how Father sees every one of us. But why isn't it happening for me? Well, we'll get to that. There's instruction. There's wisdom coming. You'll never find someone in a coffin that's still a slave to cancer. Why is that? Because the moment they died, cancer stopped growing. I said, the moment they died. You're dead, right? Aren't you dead? Christ died, you died. The moment that individual died, cancer stopped growing. Oh, there's revelation in there. Mm, 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 mm. You see, sickness and disease are a spiritual thing, and that's what Miss Marine taught on extensively back then. I'm sure I have the tapes somewhere. Yeah, tapes. <laughs> when someone dies, their spirit man, the real you, leaves the body, and the body dies no longer. It no longer functions. Do you understand that? You aren't this. You are a spirit inside this house. This is the house you have to have to be on the earth to carry you around, and you also carry the everlasting God. That's a revelation we need bigger. This proves that sickness and disease is really a spiritual thing. The spirit of man moves out of the body. What gives the body life? The spirit of man. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 24, pretend you don't know it, pretend this is the first time you've heard it. But I'm not even going to quote the whole thing. This is what we're going to do. By the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. Well, that's part of it. But that's not all of it. Isaiah 53, 4 tells us that as a result of dying to sin... Healing was right there. Right there. Looking, looking you right in the face. Do you see that? When I died to sin to the root, the very moment that I became the healed, that's the very moment I became the healed of the Lord. When 
the sin problem was taken care of, then the sickness and disease problem was taken care of. It is so beautiful. Because I died with him, I no longer have to be a slave to sickness and disease. But first you have to know you died with him. You can't just read that and go, well, yeah, thank you, Lord. I, I, no, you have to know it in order to experience it here on the earth and not just be one that, yes, you'll go to heaven, but to live. What was our, what was our base scripture? Walk. What did it say? Now. Anybody? Now walk in him. I don't see me in there. What do you think? Some of you got that. Romans 6, verse 7. For he who has died is free from sin. There it is. Verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Verse 9. Knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Isn't that what Paul said? Isn't that amazing? Paul reached a revelatory place where he could sound like Jesus. Amen? Verse 11, even so, there's another underline. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Romans 6, 1 through 10 has been telling you some wonderful in Christ realities about what Jesus did for you, about the co-crucifixion, the co-burial, the co-resurrection, this redemption that took place for you. It was for you. I said it was for you. But this is an absolute fact and reality in heaven. Is it an absolute fact and reality in your heart? It can be. Paul's letting you know you're going to have to consider yourself dead to sin and consider yourself alive unto God. You're going to do something. You're going to have to do some considering, serious considering. Now, why would you have to consider yourself to be dead to sin? Why do you have to do this considering? Or dead to sin or sickness and disease? Why is that? Well, that's a pretty easy one. Because everything on the outside is telling you you're very much alive to it. Everything's screaming at you that you're alive to it. Sin, sickness, prescriptions, drugs, pain. Yeah, it's just normal. Well, it is to the world. So don't pick on them. But it isn't to us. It doesn't belong to us at all. Not even a little bit. But the considering, you're very... Where am I? Where am I, Lord? <laughs> the world is telling you, and some of the church, unfortunately, is telling you that you're very much alive to it and that it's all normal. That's a lie. 
That's a bold-faced lie. So if you do not see and have the same mindset of Jesus, even though it's yours, bought, paid for, you're not going to experience the same life as Jesus, even though he has made it available to you. Just a truth. This is what Paul was talking about. Colossians 2, 6, As you've received Christ, now walk in him. Don't let anyone cheat you through philosophy or empty deception. There's plenty of it. According to the traditions of men, the basic principles of this world rather than according to the truth of Jesus Christ. Don't let anyone do that. Well, why would he warn us about those things? Because that's what's happening right now. And just because you got saved doesn't guarantee that you will experience walking in him. If you've received Christ as Lord and Savior, but if you don't start doing some considering and changing the way you think from a cursed mindset, you may be saved in your spirit but still think like a sinner. You're still going to get the results of a sinner, and you're no longer a sinner. But, but you'll, you can walk in those... The results will still be there. Our responses, our reactions, our thought life, everything. But he's told us how to walk in him. So that's why I asked you in the beginning, you know, you know, we read the scripture in the beginning, but did it really make any sense? Well, I want to walk in him. Well, you're going to have to tear down a few things and rebuild. He doesn't do that for you. He doesn't do that part. He doesn't renew your mind for you. To desire him like what we were singing is very personal. Somebody else can't desire Christ for you. We need to see like Jesus. You're going to have to do some serious renewing of your mind all the time. Did you notice the devil is all the time out there? What makes us think that we can part-time? All the time. Meditate therein day and night. <laughs> yeah. Some people don't like that. <laughs> Every day, considering, 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 considering the realities of who you really are in Christ. And tonight we're talking about you really are dead. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3. Since I was first into the kingdom, I found this place. It has always spoken to me. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. I'm not going to read. Well, yeah, I do have them. Okay. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking, keep seeking, keep seeking, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above and not the things that are on the earth. Here we go. 
For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. There's your position. See according to the realities of heaven. See it. You must see according to the realities of heaven. Heaven isn't struggling with these realities. And you're born of heaven. You need to study your home. <laughs> it's where you're from. You're no longer of this world. You're in it, but you're not of it. You are not of this world system. Oh, I want that one to go in deep. It doesn't matter how much gas is. Your tank is full. Don't talk like that. That's the world system falling. And it must. Because you died. You died to the principles of this world and now you are alive unto God. The realities of Jesus are yours. If you will consider it to be so, it will become a reality to you. It is possible, well here's a question, I dare ask, is it possible that the reason that many Christians still get sick is because we still think we're alive to it? I just flopped it. Even though Jesus made you dead to it, is it possible that we think, and, and, and please, no condemnation allowed in this room in Jesus' name. Not the point. The point is we're all somewhere. We're all growing. We're all somewhere. All of you have some of this already. But we need more. So, there, so then there's little pockets that are still alive to the ways of the world. Oh, no, not me. I live in the Word. Yeah, well, we'll talk later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a reason that Paul said consider it to be true, because the reality is Jesus made you that way. And if you don't know that, you're not going to experience it. And that is what Satan is trying to do and did in the garden. He started right at the get-go, folks. He didn't just start now. He didn't kick, kick up his heels during COVID, and that was his beginning. <laughs> get off of that. He started in the garden when he went after her identity. And he got her to question her identity, who she was. He got her to question it. He told her, hey... You can eat the fruit of that tree, you'll be like God. Well, the sad fact is that God had already made her like God in his image and likeness. She stepped out of grace and into works and began to work to become who she already was. Every one of us has done that, baby, and must guard against it because you can slip back into it and not even see it coming. That's why you spend so much time considering, 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 and of course do that in his presence. <laughs> Satan will whisper in your ear, listen to me, he will whisper in your ear, if you'll just do this, you'll be free. If you'll just do this, you'll be healed. If you'll just do this, you'll receive that promise you're believing for. It is not based on what you do. 
It is based on what he did. Am I telling you not to be a doer of the word? Absolutely not. But there's a fine line here that God's been showing me for a long time now. Your faith needs to be purely, purely in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. Never in what you do. Only in what he's done. Service is part of who you are. If you will learn who you are, we'll begin to live out who we are as a result and experience who we are instead of working to get something we already have. We'll do what Paul commanded us. As you've received him, now walk in him. Your considerations will produce your realities. So what are we considering? Because it will produce a reality in you, whether it's in the book or not. Your considerations will produce realities and Whatever has your affections has your faith. Those are some bombs that you probably should have wrote down. Whatever has your affections has your faith. See, in reality, we have the faith of God. I said we have God's faith. The faith of God. We have the grace of God. We have the love of God. We have the peace of God. It's all His. His faith, His grace, His love. It doesn't get any better than that. God's faith, God's grace, God's love. Wow. We don't have a faith problem, folks. We have an awareness problem. Awareness problem. The world is screaming louder than it ever has, and it's not going to get quieter, just so you know. But he needs you out there, so he needs you to know how to walk in his coverage. Like Jesus in a crowd. The crowd didn't bother him. We don't know who we are to the degree that we need to. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing, considering, renewing, considering of your mind. He said you need to change the way you think so that you're not conformed to this world. Don't turn that upside down and try to not be conformed to this world. That's not what he said. He said you need to change the way you think so that you won't be conformed. It won't be able to touch you. The enemy's real good at flip-flopping God's word. And you have to catch it. 
We need to have the experience and results that are uncommon to the world. We need to look peculiar, different from the world in every way, spirit, soul, and body. We need to be living epistles. They can read you and you're just buying groceries. But they can read you. Quit trying to be who you already are. Living epistles conformed to the world you're from. Heaven. Hallelujah. You renew your mind so that you can prove the will of God, which is good and acceptable and perfect. How can I go to do the works of God or manifest the works of heaven that I'm not aware of? How can you do that? How can you do that if you're not aware of them? It's an awareness problem. How can I produce the fruits of heaven when I still think I'm a slave to the curse? Just saying. We must change our perspective so that we can do like Jesus. My considerations will produce my realities. And whatever has my affections has my faith. This is how it comes down to how we abide in Christ. In just a minute, I'm going to have you put that up, Janae. This is how it comes down to abiding in Christ. I honestly believe that John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. Turn there, please. John 15, verses 4 and 5. I believe that this is truly the answer as to how to have success in every aspect and facet of life. And it is so simple. And I'm going to bring it to you like children's church here for a moment. In John 15, Jesus says this. Go ahead and put that up, please. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he, that one, bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, if you want to produce fruit, it's not based on your works. It is not based on your works. I have just barely tapped into the revelation I'm about to bring. And it makes me lightheaded. It's so powerful. If you want to produce fruit, it is not based on your works. It's based on your abiding in your connection. It is based on your position. It is about you being connected to him. Him is the vine. You is the branch. Is the branches connected to the vine, to the trunk, to the roots of that trunk? 
which is him. Huh. It's about being connected to him. It's based on your position. Staying connected to him. What happened? All the nourishment and nutrients that that branch, will just use me, all I had to do was stay connected to the vine. And lo and behold, look what it produced. Fruit, just like he said it would. What did the vine, what did that branch have to do? You're the branch. What did the branch have to do? Stay connected to the vine. What produced the fruit? Your connection. See, it's, it's all him. Period, period, period. It's based on your abiding in your connection. It's based on your position. It's about you being connected to him. Walk in him. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Through salvation, Jesus connected you to him. You didn't even do that part. He connected that beautiful branch to him, and all he's asking you to do is stay there. He has everything you need. Everything. Right down for the, a button on your shirt. I'm not joking. I mean, our job, the one job gave, Jesus gave us was to abide, to stay connected. You can, go, you can go outside and find any kind of tree. The only reason the fruit is being produced on that branch is because the trunk and the roots are bringing all the nutrients, bringing all the supply, and taking it right into the branch. As long as you stay connected, everything that flows through the roots and the trunk will ultimately produce the fruits on the branch. There's so much trying, 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 and it must be recognized. And it's partly why we're not seeing more of him and too much of us. Ouch. The more we expand the renewed soul, you can just leave that up there, please. The more we will expand our dominion. You see, God has given us everything we need to be success in life. You do not have to work for it. It came with the package. It's given, he's given it to you, all the equipment you need, he's already given it to you. But we have to first identify with Christ so that we can begin to see things from the proper perspective and begin to understand all the tools that he's already given you. All of heaven is open unto you. Boldly go to the throne of grace and find grace in time of need. It belongs to you. He knows you can't do it apart from him. His grace is his, his power working in and through you to do what you cannot do. It's free for the asking. He's not stingy. In fact, he'd give you so much if you'd let him, you wouldn't even know what to do with it. Whew. 
I've been made to sit down at the right hand of God in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. We have all of heaven available to us in Christ. Oof. Thank you, Jesus. We're almost there. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians 1, verse 3. He has blessed me with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Not some. Say that. He has blessed me with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We're carriers and dispensers of heavenly realities. We're not just to carry it around and keep it for ourselves. We're to be dispensing it. People are supposed to be able to walk past you or stand behind you in the line at the grocery store and pick your fruit. You have what they need. You don't have to fuss and try and just be you. Connected to him. And, and it, you won't even hardly recognize yourself. How do I abide in Christ? How do I walk in Christ? I have, I have to see myself connected to him. See myself one with him. See myself as dead with him and alive unto God. It is in him that I live and move. In him, in him, walk in him, that I live and move and have my being and just took that last breath. He blessed me with another breath. Dear God, there's another one. Dear God, do you realize that? That he's sustaining your life since he created you? You're not just breathing. He gave you that. Every one of them. Every one of those breaths. In him that I live and move and have my being. Abiding is where fruit is produced. Whatever your thoughts are on, that's what you're connected to. You either are being more connected to him or less to the things of this world or the opposite. You're always going forward or backwards. There's no such thing as standing still. True backsliding is where you're less aware of God right now than you were five minutes ago. Remember I said you're either going forward or backwards. Just saying. True backsliding is, see we've got this picture of backsliders. Well, we're going we're gonna to kill that cow tonight. True backsliding is where you're less aware of God right now than you were five minutes ago. Less aware, less conscious, connected to him, and closer. And if you stay there, the closer you get to where sin starts raining in, it'll rain you in again, it'll rain into your life, and you'll backslide. Not me. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but I'm going to watch. <laughs> As you've received him, now walk in him. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you will produce much fruit and your fruit will last. Just like in heaven, they'll pick one off. I need some peace. Well, here you go. And as soon as they take a piece of peace off you, off the branch, another one shows up. That's how it is in heaven. When you walk on the grass, your footprint disappears as soon as you pick up your foot. Well, you don't have to wait till heaven. As he is, so am I in this world. But it won't be a reality to you if you don't consider and consider and consider yourself dead. I want you to say with good breath, I'm dead to sin. I need, I need you to mean it. I didn't believe you. 
I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to sickness. I'm dead to disease. I'm dead to pain. I'm dead to anger. I'm dead to depression. I am dead to all the curse. I am dead to the ways of the world. When Jesus died, I died. See, you just started. I've been getting up every morning and just letting the walls have it and the cat too. Because I have to know I'm dead before I can experience the resurrection. Why haven't we seen more? This is why. We're not dead yet. I mean, we are. But the reality of it must, with passion, go after this. Praise the Lord. I'm going to... Thank you, Lord. Close your eyes for a minute. I'm going to pray. Holy Spirit, I ask you right now that you would open up these truths in a greater way that we would be so much more sensitive to your voice in your leading and your guiding and your direction. Give us the thoughts and the images that we need to put our minds on now. You are the revealer of truth. Show us. Show us things to come as you said in your word. Oh. Show and reveal so we can walk in a greater degree of glory. Help us both to go from faith to faith and glory to glory. To walk in all the spiritual resources that you've made available to us. To walk in absolute confidence, knowing that every single thing we see in this world, we are dead to it. Everything of the curse, we're dead to it. Because we are alive unto you. That as he is, so are we in this world. And we thank you for it. We thank you, thank you, thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Glory be to God. We're going to sturdy up our foundation. Amen. Well, so for, for um, the bringing of the tithe and giving of offerings, hmm, this is a good place to be dead to some stuff. How about dead to stingy? Dead to fear? Dead to the love of money? Oh, we could have fun here. It's his, it's not ours. Just like every breath you've got, every penny you've got, uh, it's his. Well, no, he said just bring the tenth and the rest is mine. No, that's not quite what he said. It's yours, but it's not yours to do what you want with. And, and I don't know about you, but I need a jack up there. Yeah, so if you need an envelope, lift your hand. The ushers would love to serve you in your giving. If you're giving cash or a check. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
we consider all that you've given us, but we also remember, Father, that we're in blood covenant partnership with you, and all that we have belongs to you, and all that you have belongs to us. It's a two-way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, let's stand up. We just love you, Lord. We love you so. We love you so much. We want to know you. Eternal life is to know you. We want to know you. So even in this time of bringing the tithes and giving offerings, we stand before you completely and wholly yours. Whatever you need to flow in and through us in the upcoming days, we want to be those vessels that you can trust and move through. So tonight we begin by obeying your word, bringing our tithes, giving our offerings. We do it with grateful hearts, thanksgiving and joy, knowing that our faith isn't even in our giving. Our faith is in your death, your burial, and your resurrection. Our faith is in your faithfulness. We give because we love you. We love you. We love people like you love people. We love the kingdom. So that's why we're giving. That's why we're obeying. Because we love you. And we know you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>